All right. So welcome everyone to our October genealogy tea time for the Sons of the American Revolution Genealogical Research Library. Um, this is kind of a series program we do not every month, but every other month, every couple months, something like that. We cover different topics. Um, I'm Sherry Daniels. I'm the director of library and archives here at the SAR Library, which is in the national headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky. For those of you who are not in the region or have never been to see us, um, that is where we're located. And please, please come see us anytime. And um, so today's topic is the legend of Sleepy Hollow and other revolutionary ghost stories. And we do, before I get fully into everything, I do want to introduce our librarian, Walker Byer. He's here to uh, to assist today, and he's done a lot of research as well. We're going to cover a lot of material. Um, the genealogy tea times are designed to be discussion. So, you know, feel free to break in if there's something that, that we talk about and that you wanted to add some stuff to it. You feel free to do that either verbally or through um, through the chat. And probably the first hour, we're going to cover a lot of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow itself. And then we're going to dig into the second hour, a little bit more of the other stories that are out there. Um, I, <clears throat> quick show of hands, or you can do the virtual hands or whatever, or even in the chat. How many of you have read the original Excellent. Legend of Sleepy Hollow short story? Anybody? Yeah, me, me and Walker have. <laughs> wasn't sure if I should raise my hand or not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, great. Okay. So not many of you. And the thing is, it's really worth a read. It is fascinating. Um, yes, here we've got one. I read it like 30 years ago. I was um I was not expecting the significant connection to the Revolutionary War that was in there, um, the various little stories that are covered that we'll, we'll talk about in here. And the little teaser that I gave out on Facebook about um, the capture of Major John Andre, that's in this story. I mean, how many would have thought that that was in this story? You often don't hear that part. So we're going to cover a lot of that. And it's very, very surprising. Uh, one, dis one, I guess I would say caution, or um, there are some antiquated harmful stereotypes in there in some of the descriptions, especially with um, African-American groups. But um, again, of the time, it was published in 1819, 20. Okay. Yeah, he was writing it probably in 1819, and then it was published in 20. Um, so not surprising for the time uh, as uh, you know when this was published but that's there um but anyway it's a really great read and i'm used to seeing it you know either in movie or cartoon or whatever but love it now that brings us to another part of this is why would we want to cover a fictional scary story for um for genealogy tea time now yes it's set uh, it, do, it does connect to the Revolutionary War. However, one of the things that I often recommend to people when I teach about genealogy is if you get into these, these earlier years of the 19th century and then into the 18th century when our record keeping wasn't as consistent um, nor robust in some cases, um, you know, there are some big gaps in some of the records depending on what state that you're in. And, you know, especially to even, you know, census records, even just as an example, you know, um, the little hash marks, uh, except for the head of the household, which is usually a free white mm -hmm. male. And so getting information about our ancestors from this time can be more challenging and even trying to figure out um, how they live. What was their life like? And literature of the time is a really great way to kind of just dig into what the culture was like. Um, one little just side little note detail that I was actually talking with Walker about recently, just actually this earlier today. And I said one note that Washington Irving, who's the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, one of the things he did was when he described how Ichabod Crane as a school teacher was uh, instead of having his own place to live, even though he was the school teacher of the local area, he rotated 
his living quarters basically with the parents of his pupils. And so he rotationally would stay with these different folks. And I'm like, that's probably just a cultural detail that Washington Irving has just put in there because it was probably common knowledge. I had not heard of that. I mean, I think that's really interesting. But again, all these different things. Now we're going to cover too about how many things that that Washington Irving brings into this story that are very, um, very tied to the fact that it was actually about Terrytown, New York, and Sleepy Hollow became a place that was to the north, and um, that these are real places. And he even cl- includes names of real real surnames that are from the area. Um, there's a lot of details in that. Even though these this is fiction, you know, we can kind of get into the mindset of someone who's trying to describe this area, describe what the people were like, what did they believe at the time? Clearly, we're talking about, you know, ghost stories and how they were sharing these stories. So, uh, like I said, but, um, fiction is also a way that you can kind of get into the mindset of the time of your ancestors and um, what they found to be important, how they were living, all of that. Um, so a little bit of a backstory about Washington Irving before we move too far. Um, it was written by him. We talked about the 1819, 20-ish. It's first published as um, short stories in newspapers. That's usually one of the places or ways that you can see some of these. When I talked about um, literature of the time, don't forget that you can also, not every little story was then picked up and published in a book format. So those newspapers of the time, which we all love researching those newspapers, um, those can be great for reading the little little anecdotal stories that are in there as well. They can give you a little bit of insight into the culture of the time as well. So that's how these would have been published first. Then um, they were they were put together. Washington Irving was writing a lot of little short stories at the time, and they were collectively then published in a book form, and it was called The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon. Yes, Crayon. Um, and so, which it, it did, Walker, it did include uh, the story of Rip Van Winkle, didn't it? Is it that- did, yes. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen for a moment because, so the great thing about this is we don't have... Now, can you guys see The Legend of Sleepy Hollow? A book? That was, okay, great. So The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, in that sketchbook, um, this is something, we don't have the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon in our physical collection here in the library. But you can pull up a free copy at the Library of Congress, and that's actually what I'm using right now. And... um, there's a little note there. It says found among the papers of the late Dietrich Knickerbocker. So this is kind of a little tongue in cheek way that Washington Irving is introducing these stories. The Dietrich Knickerbocker was a, I would call it a viral story that, um, or persona that Washington Irving created. And he, he put in little ads um, in the newspaper in New York saying that this Dietrich Knickerbocker was missing. Um, Please help us find this person. He was like a local historian and people got into it. In fact, uh, one of the, I think it was one of the, it was either one of the banks or the newspapers, I can't remember, offered a reward for anyone who could find this Dietrich Knickerbocker. Well, it turns out it was just completely uh, something that Washington Irving had made up. But he kind of keeps that that kind of little string going because it became so popular and people were so it was like it was a buzz. It went viral and people were really intrigued by this persona of Diedrich Knickerbocker. So he's keeping this this thread going as far as the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, um, so one of the things let's see. Again, that's free. Go to the Library of Congress, search for that. You can download. This version is not the 1820s. I mean, this is probably like 1890s. Um, but again, you can you can download the full book. And I'm just like in page, you know, 441 of that full book there. Um, so one of the things is we start into, we're going to start dissecting right out of the gate some of these details that he's got. Because remember, this is a real place. And Washington Irving was living. Now, he was not born in Terrytown, um, he, but he did live there. He went there when he was a teenager, staying with a cousin due to the yellow yellow fever outbreak. And uh, turns out as well, he also lived the last, I believe it was like the last 35 years of his life in Sleepy Hollow. And again, Sleepy Hollow is 
has always been known as like an extension of Terrytown. It was never its own specific town until I believe it was actually finally incorporated in 1996. So, um, so he, he stayed there. He, he knew he had some knowledge of this place and that old adage of write what you know. And he was writing about this place, but injecting a lot of fiction into it as well. So that's kind of where we kind of look at the setting and say, some of this is de definitely some real elements. And then, you know, then there's, it's peppered with all of these fictional things as well. All right. So in between, uh, let's see, I think one of the things we were going to talk about too was in between the time before he wrote this, he lived in Terrytown when he was a teenager, but then he went where Walker, he went to Europe, didn't he? He went to Europe and actually that's where he met Sir Walter Scott who um, Sir Walter Scott actually had a fascination with Germanic folklore. And in, I want to say, 1773 and 1786, he had previously translated two different Germanic ballads, which were said to be inspiration for Irving's um, Headless Horseman and the overall legend of Sleepy Hollow. So um, those two stories are the, um, William and Helen and The Chase. Those are the two, those were what they became after Irving had, or after um, Sir Walter Scott had translated them. Yes, yes. And those are things you can access well as well as ho at home. Um, so this Headless Horseman concept that was already in Europe as well, um, we're also going to cover the fact that there are some other examples of headless horsemen that are also associated with the revolution. Um, I mean, I would think about any, any place you have a battle where you're using cannon that that might happen, right? Somebody's head might be taken off. <laughs> so, and it's a, that's a, let's face it. That's a terrible way to go. Uh, might be a quick way to go, but that's a bad way to go. And so it's just, it's so traumatic for people too, that it's like, Okay, so now they've got this ghost story associated with this kind of, of uh, a victim. And um, so, yeah, we're going to actually cover some of what is um, what is known in the Revolutionary War ghost stories. Um, let's see. Okay, so the opening paragraph that is uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. We talk about the bosom. He talks about the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson at that broad expansion of the river dominated by the ancient Dutch navigators, the Tappan Zee, and where they always suddenly shortened the sail and implored protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed. There lies a small market town or rural port, which by some is called Greensburg, but which is more generally properly known by the name of Terrytown. Now that's Interesting. Number one, he's painting this. He's talking about immigration coming in. He's talking about the settlers coming in, what they know about that. Greensburg was new to me. I had not heard that one before. Um, Terrytown, I think, is fascinating because he says, this name was given, we are told, in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. Um, so they were tarrying too long, apparently, in the tavern after after they'd been to market. Whether that is true or not, we don't know. Um, but it's a it's a it's a wonderful little anecdote that he added there as well. So then as he's talking about uh, going through describing, and that's the thing about when you read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is that there is a lot of flowery prose when it comes to describing the um the the place of that that valley and he gets into dis he describes trees he describes streams bubbling brooks he describes quail i mean all these different details that you might see but this is customary especially at this time 1820s um you're definitely getting to that pastoral um, trend in, in literature. And so that, in fact, we actually even see that develop in cemeteries, by the way, the iconography in cemeteries is starting to change as well. Instead of seeing these harsh images in, uh, in the carvings, you start seeing more angelic weeping willows, urns, that's tied to everything. That is a big trend for all of this. Um, now we do get into a little bit of a different trend as well you start seeing some darker stories coming out so you get like a gothic period coming into more 20s 30s 40s um 
So he's right on target as far as what is really popular at the time. So let's talk of this small brook glides through it. So he's really getting descriptive on trying to set the scene. And he's talking about, hey, he talks about squirrel shooting. Um, and then let's go into a little bit of the spooky things that he starts to describe. And um, so when he talks about the original Dutch settlers and the Sleepy Hollow Boys, start noticing some of the descriptions that you see here. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Ma Master Hendrick Hudson. Um, certain it is the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. So see these words he's using. He's talking about a spell. He's talking about witchcraft in a way. Um, and so he's not, he's not really leaping right over to ghost. He's talking about more bewitching in his, uh, in his description. And then about the people, he says, they are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs. Um, they're subject to trances and visions and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales haunted spots and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country. And the nightmare with her whole ninefold seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambles. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander in chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. A key uh, point I want to point out that description, commander in chief of all the powers of the air, that actually goes back to a biblical verse. Um, that is how Satan is described in the Bible: is that he's basically he commands, um, he commands, he's the power of prince of the power of the air, from Ephesians two two. So there, he's immediately tying this entity, this headless horseman, to Satan himself. It's a very devilish um, uh, apparition. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley but extend at time to the adjacent roads and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Um, indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning the specter allege that the body of the trooper having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle and nightly quest of his head, and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Um, so one of the things is, uh, I believe part of this is, is that they, he describes the headless horseman, like sometimes his horse will be seen at the churchyard where the graveyard basically. Um, and so one thing to note as well, in this story, he talks about the timing and he says that it's 30 years since the time or should we say before the time of the writing of the story. So that would put it roughly around 1790. And he goes into other details. He starts talking about the Van Tassel family. We all know we've heard of Katrina Van Tassel um, as the main character, one of the main characters, uh, the woman that he is courting. He's, he's very much uh, infatuated with her and her family's wealth and the food they provide. So there's a lot of details that goes into Katrina's, <laughs> Katrina's character. Um, but the Van Tassel family was a real family in the area. And in fact, if you go to the cemetery now uh, in, in Sleepy Hollow, there are several Van Tassels that are buried there. And um, I'm going to 
skip ahead here to 427. I want to show you another little <clears throat> detail. Ooh, I just saw the I just saw a description of silver teapot. Here's to the tea. <laughs> All right. Okay. So one of the things that I think is fun about in pop culture and um, how the Sleepy Legend of Sleepy Hollow has been presented in in movies and and whatnot. And of course, one of the early ones that we're all familiar with is the Disney version of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And as you read the original, they clearly drew the character exactly as Washington Irving described it. Um, I mean, from his from his really long shoes that are like shovels, his his big ears and his spindly neck and his profile that looked like he was a weather vane. It is exact. And I love that. Um, as I read this, I'm like, I'm immediately seeing the cartoon. But one of the details that Washington Irving puts in here is he had, that Washington Irving, ha or that Ichabod Crane, had several, he had read several books. He was a great learned man, basically. He was a, but he had in his possession, um, and he had read, see, he had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. Um, so, Walker, did you find, because you were trying to find the Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft. We know that Cotton Mather was a real person. We know that he actually wrote pieces. And if you want to go into a little backstory on what you found with that. So I did not find anything that Cotton Mather had written by that title. However, I have found several. I know that his two prominent works concerning witches and apparitions um, were illustrious providences and let me pull up the title real quick in front of me um the one after that was called the wonders of the invisible world being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in new england and of several remarkable curiosities therein occurring um as i was saying before i think that might be the book that irving is referencing um but given that that's a really long title that I just read, it could make sense that it was, you know, kind of adapted and truncated. Yeah. Uh, and for anyone who doesn't know, Cotton Mather was one of the um, early Puritan clergy. Um, both he and his father, Increase, were known for their works against um, anything deemed to be related to witchcraft or the demonic. Um, Cotton was right there in the fray in Salem in 1692. Um, and, you know, at the time he, at that time when, well, later even, um, at post-Salem, you know, that time when the colonies were still trying to find themselves and things like that, he was one of the people that had enough authority to influence the minds of the colonists because um, they were in that area or that era where they're trying to get away from old European thinking and systems of government and things like that. And right along with that is kind of pulling away from this European superstition, which the Mathers were still spouting. There's even a, there's even a really interesting bit of history that I found where um, in Albany, New York, they discovered a fossil. It was a large tooth and Mather had written back to London um, to say that this was proof of the existence of the Nephilim that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson was one of those who kind of countered that kind of like, no, no, it was later, you know, Obviously, there were a lot of people who realized that this was probably a, just a very large animal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Jefferson had a, quite a uh, he quite an obsession with with fossils and, yeah, and what the, that meant. The one of the sources I was looking at for this, um, which I highly recommend if anyone's interested, it's called Monsters in America. Um, it's by his last name is Poole, P O O L E. It's really good. Um, he describes kind of. Cotton and Jefferson as having, they were the two kind of having sway over the mind, um, over people's thinking. And that was a good example that was used. 
Awesome. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the Nephilim that that he uh, just talked about, that was basically those were those were the the beings that were products between was it fallen angels and man or I was think it, it angels I, and man I think before it de- the fall. It depends on the lore you're looking at. Most right. commonly, I'm familiar with them as being the products of just angels and man. Mm-hmm. But they were might have been part of the punishment thing. Like, what you did, what <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah, you weren't supposed to do that, weren't supposed to be done. Um, but yeah. they, you know, they were described as being so gigantic. So, when this fossil was unearthed, and you know, and you know, people of the time, they they their world was superstitious and wondrous, even though they were trying to establish themselves as a, as a new nation in a way, they still had those roots in superstition and lore. And as they called them at the time, wonders, hence the title of Mather's work, The yes. Wonders of the Invisible World. Yes. And and remember the early descriptions I just said when he was talking about the valley and, and the people that lived there, when he talks about they had visions and, you know, um, there was all in, visions and dreams and that they had this basically this kind of, it was like he was describing some of the wasn't it some of the accusations that were levied against those who were accused of witchcraft in the Salem area? He's using terms that would have coincided directly with that kind of activity. Um, And then of course, then you, then you later on see this direct connection to Cotton Mather that he's trying to make to Ichabod Crane. So he's tying this very much into that dark spirit realm that is, uh, you know, that's very tied to the witchcraft, to the witch trials, and all of that. So, and I think that's very much on purpose. He's building that character, even though he's fiction, he's, he's clearly building, um, building him based on what was known, like you said, um, what they knew about uh, with the witch trials and everything. Uh, to add, I'd like to add on to that, actually, um, mm-hmm. a quote, ref, a quote from the book I just mentioned, which I will put in the chat. Um, sorry, the, the actual name is escaping me right now. Um, the author does make mention of Crane's character in reference to the, you know, how he was developed, saying that Crane is representative of the American Puritan, eager for stories of monsters and ready to believe in the devilish nature of the American frontier. So that kind of, you know, it's right there with that. Exactly. Um, okay, so now we're going to go. We're going to keep going for a little bit. I want to go back to, I need to go back to page 446 because I want to talk about how these stories or what kind of stories that they were passing along to each other. All right. So this is basically removed ahead in the story a little bit about, um, about the party. You guys have all heard about the party that was happening at the Van Tassels before he is his meetup with the headless horseman. So he's talking, let's see when the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who with old Van Tassel sat smoking at one end of the piazza, gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war. This neighborhood at the time of which I am speaking was one of those highly favored places which abound with chronicle and great men. The British and American line had run near it during the war. It had therefore been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees, cowboys, and all kinds of border chivalry. Just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each storyteller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction and in the distinctness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit. There was a story of, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Dauphin, Dauphin, Margling, a large blue bearded Dutchman who had nearly taken a British frigate with an old iron nine pounder from a mud breastwork, only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge. And there was an old gentleman who sat, who shall be nameless, being too rich a manier to be lightly mentioned, who in the Battle of White Plains, being an excellent master of defense, parried a musket ball with a small sword, insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz around the blade and glance off at the hilt, in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword, with the, with the hilt a little bent. There were several more that had been equally great in the field, not one of them whom but was persuaded that he had a considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination. But all of these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered... Actually, I'm going to stop right there, actually. 
I actually don't want to go that far on that one because that's actually a very important, uh, important point that we're going to actually go for in just a minute. Um, so one of the things I wanted to note is that he's describing, and I'm going to stop sharing here for a second because I want to actually... All right. So one of the things I want to note is that when you talk about Terrytown and its connection to the Revolutionary War, um, in fact, I might actually share this, share this again for a second because I want to fast forward. OK, so they go on to some of the stories. Uh, I did skip the part that I want to skip because we'll come back to that one. Um, all right. So supernatural stories in the parts uh, owning to the vicinity of Sleepy Hollow. And then this, they called this very air that blew from that haunted region. So there's a couple of things here that he notes. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trays and funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken and which stood in the neighborhood. Some mention was made also of the woman at the, in white that haunted the dark glen at Raven Rock and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. So we're talking about, and then he gets into the Headless Horseman once again. And um, here, this is where he says, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. So the tree where Major Andre was taken. I want to stop for a second and I want to talk about that because that's a detail that completely surprised me when I read this story. And one of the things that I did find, and let's see if I can. So there is a book in our collection that I ran across and it's called An Account of the Action at Terrytown and of its Commemoration. Now this is a little book from, nine, from 1899 and this was done not by the Sons of the American Revolution, but it's by uh, one of the one of the other groups, Sons of the Revolution. Um, and in this, it was a commemoration of Terrytown, uh, the action during the revolution that had taken place. And inside is this beautiful. Where's my Where's my camera? Oh, uh, it disappeared. And I but I'm going to show it to you guys on the screen. There's a map of what was going on in the area in Terrytown. Now, what's great about this book is that because it's 1899, and if you go to our catalog, our library catalog, and look for that ebook connection that you can make anytime you see ebook after our call number, you can click on the record and then scroll down to the electronic resources, and it'll give you a link where you can go read this yourself. So you can absolutely go and read this anytime on your own for free. And but what I wanted to show you is all right. So in the lower right, you can see, tap and see, the Terry, uh, Terrytown in the major, let's see, in the manor of Phillips, Westchester, uh, Phillipsburg, Westchester, 1781. Now that's what they have created in, this is in the book in 18, 1899. So what they've done is they've tried to just, they've tried to draw this whole area of the Terrytown and, and, the Terrytown region, and they've tried to put in things like, let me see if I can get into and zoom a little bit more. There's military strategic uh, places in this map. There are all different kinds of things that you can see. However, what's very interesting about this is even though this would have been less than this, less than a hundred years from when Washington Irving would have written the book. If we zoom in on several things here, here is, it says Major Andre of the British Army taken here September 23rd, 1780. So this, this little area, they've got this marked, um, but they also have Elizabeth Van Tassel's Tavern up here, right near. Um, notice this little swamp here, which is where the Maj Major Andre was taken. Um, Remember the story said there was a tree and that that's, that that's where he was taken. Um, in the actual story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, he describes where he basically is meeting uh, the, he first learns that the headless horseman is chasing him is in this place called Wiley Swamp. And so it's on this map. They have included this, even though it is a fictional story, in the commemoration of what was going on in Terrytown, they are putting these landmarks in here. And all the way over here, 
Think about where Wiley Swamp is. You go all the way down this Albany, this road to Albany. Right here, it says bridge where Ichabod Crane had his encounter with the headless horseman. Um, I just find that interesting that that tells you how closely what Washington Irving was describing in his fictional account, how much the locals identified with how he described things. So he's literally describing physical places. His the path he, that Ichabod Crane is taking these other. Here's in fact, here's another uh, Van Tassel house down right down here so all of this is you know he's describing a real place so he's got this mixture of fiction and 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 real facts in here and so i found that was very interesting that they had put all of this together into this one map in 1899 as they are commemorating the revolutionary activity that was going on um, at the time and i'm going to share something else with you here is another this is an engraving that was done in, I believe, 1856, and it's about the capture of Major Major Andre. Now, one thing that we learned is that that, that tree, uh, apparently it happened near a tree. Now, he didn't die there. Um, he was then, he was captured. He was taken over to, um, I think it was Tappan, Tappan, New York. And he was tried for espionage. He was hung. And um, but this tree is just where where they where they captured him. And I have another I have another small account here. I'm going to stop sharing this for a second. And this is another book we have in our in our collection called The History of the Terry Towns. And they describe the capture of of Major John Andre. And it talks about on that on that evening, there's three farmers in the area of Terrytown, and they're serving in the state militia. And um, basically, you know, this is that whole uh, that whole episode where Benedict Arnold um, is meeting with John Andre. There's this, he's trying to give up the fort. Um, he's even tried to turn in George Washington. There's, there's a lot that's going on at this moment. Um, and when he is captured, okay, so Andre Road without incident as far as Terrytown, they're just south of the present Terrytown, nor just south of the present Terrytown dash North Terrytown border. So North Terrytown is what we traditionally now is is referred to as Sleepy Hollow. So that's why that map makes that um, why it makes that designation as far as where that where that is where he was caught. Uh, he was stopped at gunpoint for questioning by three young militiamen, John Paulding, Isaac Van Wart, and David Williams. They were not on duty, for they had been allowed a week at home to help gather the harvest. Andre, misled by the green Hessian coat worn by Paulding, and it says in parentheses, who had escaped from a British prison in New York only four days earlier. So I think it's funny, actually, that it also brings, that's a Hessian coat. And I, I think it's an interesting detail because the headless horseman is supposed to be a Hessian. Um, totally, probably not even related at all. However, I think it's an interesting detail. Um, let's see. Admitted that he was a British officer. The trio then revealed themselves as Americans. And in spite of Andre's attempts to buy his freedom, took him prisoner. So this, um, in fact, even the three militiamen received gold medals for their government, from their government with the inscriptions, the love of country conquers uh, several decades later, they were permanently and publicly honored by the erection of a monument in Patriots Park on North Broadway near the site of the capture. So, um, so historically, um, this book does does acknowledge the legend of Sleepy Hollow, uh, but they also then give that full that full account of what happened where uh, Major John Andre was captured. Now, in the story, when Ichabod is he suddenly believes he's being chased by the Hubble's horseman. It's right at a place. It's where basically Major John Andre's tree in that Wiley swamp. And he describes a tree and he says, uh, he's, he saw something, a figure white. And he said, that's where the tree had been struck by lightning. Now, the thing is, you cannot go to Major John Andre's tree today because the tree was struck by lightning. But after the time frame of when the legend of Sleepy Hollow was, um, was written. And in fact, um, it was, there's another legend that goes with it, is that, that the tree was struck by lightning in 1801 and, and completely burnt out and destroyed it, you know, 
it was it was it was gone um, in 1801. And the local legend is that it was struck by lightning at the time when they all received news that Benedict Arnold had died. Not the date of his death, but when they received news of his death. So it also then ties basically the demise of this tree to Benedict Arnold. So the, the threads of the revolution in this story are quite fascinating. Now, we do believe um, that, in fact, we had read some of the other accounts we'd read is that that tree was struck by lightning more than once. Um, and then, you know, the idea that Washington Irving wrote about that tree, they're like, well, would he have seen that tree? Did that tree exist? Yes, it existed in Terrytown when he was living there as a teenager. But um, by the time, you know, and in 1790, the tree would have existed, which was supposed to be the setting of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, but by 1820, when the when the story is published, that tree didn't exist anymore. So it's complicated. Um, so <laughs> quite a complicated narrative with that one. But again, we're getting some of that as well. Um, all right. So one of the things that we have we had trouble with when we were coming up with this. I I I, I put this topic on our on our list to discuss before I'd ever read the story. And before I'd act ever actually done any deep dive into the Revolutionary War ghost stories. And so one of the things I do want to kind of go back to what he says about ghost stories in here. Okay. Um, let's see. All of these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered, long, settled retreats but are trampled underfoot by the shifting throng that forms the population of most of our country places. Besides, there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages, for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves in their graves before surviving friends have traveled away from the neighborhood, so that when they turn out at night to walk their rounds, they have no acquaintance left to call upon. This is perhaps the reason why we so seldom hear of ghosts except in our long-established Dutch communities. So, that statement actually fit a lot of what we were finding. Um, obviously, when you start researching things like ghost stories in the Revolutionary War, you know, you you naturally go, we start, yeah, you start with a Google search, right? You start to see what, what are people writing about? Um, and we weren't finding a lot. I was very surprised. Yes, you'd find some things, um, but just not the same prevalence that you would find, let's say, surrounding the Civil War. Um, now, granted, we're in Kentucky, Indiana, like we're we're in this this Ohio Valley region. We're not connected to the known battles and places of the Revolutionary War. So we're not on the East Coast. We're not we're not hearing these ghost stories all that often. And um, so to see that Washington Irving made a note of the fact that ghost stories were not there weren't that many uh, that he that that he could recollect even to tell as, as you know, and he had a reason for it. He said, it's because they're, they're moving West. People are moving out of the area, but these, but these long established Dutch communities are staying put. So the memory of the people who died, who can haunt, basically that's, he's given the reason. Um, so let's see origin. Let's see. We talked about the headless horseman. This is another book. This one uh, I'd like to feature. This is not in our collection, actually. I just recently purchased this. This is called Spirits of 76. It is by a man named Daniel Barefoot. And he went through and um, he was, look how thick this book is, actually. This is a pretty big, this is a pretty big book. I was very surprised when I got it in the mail. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot. There's a lot of ghost stories. My only complaint now, this is this is a really good book because he does go state by state. And and in fact, if you can see kind of his his map, um, boy, my, that weird background likes to attack books. When you put them up. Um, but yeah, he's going up, up along and he's trying to pull out as many ghost stories as he can that are connected to the revolution. He himself is from North Carolina. That's where he resides. So um, he has grown up with a lot of them, he says. And my only complaint, I wish that he had done, it says that his sources are, are little anecdotes of the areas, 
Um, some, I believe some of the, like, you know, the national parks and things, um, people that own the properties as far as the houses or, or things like that. And I just wish he had cited the sources of where he got the stories. You know, was it a newspaper? Was it this publication? Was it this person that told me this story or, or wherever? But he said he's been collecting these for a long, long, for many, many years. And so maybe it's just, you know, again, a lot of times we collect these stories and things like this, and maybe he's not, he's not citing them, um, which, which is disappointing, but it is a really fun read. And there's a lot of things in here. Um, there is another, in fact, I think we were going to talk about the origin of the headless horseman. We talked a little bit about it earlier, didn't we? Um, yeah. so there's another one though, that is very interesting to me that is um it's called a ghost story within a ghost story it's out of delaware and it talks about this young person in fact it starts out talking about the 1820 washington irving story um but it says that there's another one in delaware another story and it's about this uh the miller family and this um let's see they were let's see uh charles miller senior had supplied the americans with foodstuffs for almost a year without compensation Washington, greatly moved, extended his gratitude to the humble man. Well, now Charles Miller had a son, Charles Miller Jr., who was a teenager at the time. And when Washington's army was nearby, he decided he was going to join up. And um, his goodness, like his first foray, his very first battle, um, as the British cannons unleashed their deadly fury, one of the balls hit the ground, bounced, decapitated the teenager and smashed into the church wall. In parentheses, it says the imprint of the lethal ball can yet be seen. And then it says, eyewitnesses claimed Charlie's headless corpse mounted a horse and galloped off in a northerly direction. So, wow, there's another detail right there. And then it says two days later, as George Washington prepared his defenses at Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, British snipers were already about Washington's height and imposing presence immediately attracted the attention of the red coat markman, marksman who took deadly aim with her musket. But before they could fire a sword wielding headless horseman charged from the forested area area behind the general passed directly through Washington and galloped towards his would be assassins bullets fired at the phantom horseman missed their mark uh, with one deadly sweep. The horseman's sword carried away the heads of the pickets. Washington and his attendants stood in utter dis disbelief as the apparition disappeared into the darkness along the riverbank. Um, that's that's a very violent ghost, I'm just going to say. Um, but <laughs> very vengeful, very, very violent. Um, but again, <clears throat> that's another Headless Horseman story in the in the list of Revolutionary War stories. Um, one of the things that... Um, Oh, good. We've, we've covered now. We're going to start getting into more of the other stories out there. So um, what about if maybe, uh, Walker, you tell us about Hulda. Hulda the Witch is a good one. Oh, Hulda the Witch. I would I would really love to know if she existed. Real. <laughs> right? um, so it was interesting, like you had mentioned, to see the number of times and the various ways in which Irving had described Sleepy Hollow to be bewitched and it's, you know, witching, the, the witching nature of it. Um, and anyone who knows me knows my own personal interest in witches um, and especially spooky season. And, you know, anyway, hold up. Um, <laughs> so Lore says that there was a witch that lived in Sleepy Hollow or around the area. Her name was Hulda. Um, let me see. I don't want to read all of this because it is a bit long. Um, Hulda was described to be a bohemian woman who was on the outskirts of the town. Um, as with most perceived witches of the time, she was shunned by the community. Um, she, unlike unlike many of the stories that we hear about witches around that time, she didn't face persecution as much as just being ostracized. Um, I have a really good account of her story. At first I couldn't find anything. It was just the same blogger or the same blogger who was spinning this story. And, and I didn't know if it was credible, but apparently I think in 1947, 
placed a grave marker for Hulda, um, you know, acknowledging her existence on some level. Um, and then outside of that blogger, I was actually able to find a more, with respect to the blogger, a more credible source um, the, called The Chronicles of Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow, published in 1897 by Edgar Matthew Bacon. There's a whole chapter on lore in there. And a lot of the little snippets that are mentioned in that description um, in Irving's story about the other tales of ghosts and apparitions in the area are mentioned here, one of those being Hulda. Um, so she lived in her own little cave. And um, let me see. Uh, I mean, she she seemed to be a, you know, a nice woman. There's a chap, there's a section here where it says, um, in those days, men patrolled highways to intercept cattle thieves that ran off their stock. And as the population became smaller, the women sometimes took their places with the flintlock and the powder horn. Hulda, the witch, presented herself for this service, but no one wanted her companionship. At the last day, a force of British landed from one of the transports that had sailed up the Hudson and commenced a march, which was to bring them by, mean, by means of the King's Highway to the rear of Putman's position at Peekskill. As they marched in, imposing, as they marched in, imposing array, a volley greeted them from behind, from behind walls and tree trunks. It was Lexington repeated at Westchester County. Not to be repulsed this time, Hulda fought with her neighbors, using her rifle with effect so that she was singled out for vengeance. And before the redcoats retreated to their boats, they had, by means of a sortie, overtaken and killed the witch. Animated by a new respect, those who had seen her fight avowed that witch or no witch, she had earned the right to a Christian burial. Reverently, they carried her to her cabin and where they discovered between the leaves of her Bible, a paper informing them of a little store of gold that she had desired to have distributed among the widows whose husbands had fallen for their country. Hulda's grave, it is said, is close by the north wall of the old church, as though her neighbors, having done her what despite they could during her lifetime, were desirous to atone after her death by an exhibition of party respect. So she took out some people. Apparently, despite, you know, she wasn't welcome in the community, but she still wanted to protect the community. Yes, that's military yeah. action, man. She, up, she picked up a gun. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to really deep dive into that. I wanted to try to get as much, you know, a wide array of information as possible, because I know we're, we've got several veins here that we're going down, and I didn't want to get too obsessed with her. Um, right. So I didn't have time to, you know, really get into that but there are pictures of the um of the tombstone online um that can be found so right um, and um wasn't there somebody that said um that said that like her her story they didn't know whether there were whether this had actually whether she'd existed or not or something like that there was um there was somebody had written about it and it was like uh it could have happened or or whatever but yet there's I guess her story has been in the community enough. Exactly. And that's, that's kind of what I was saying where when all I, all I was finding were multiple articles by this one person and I'm going, okay, I'm not, which is why I said, you know, with respect to the blogger, I don't know anything about them. I didn't have time to deep dive on them or their credibility, but I was seeing in multiple places. And then I was seeing the pictures of the tombstones. So to come across this in a much older source right. was really interesting. Yeah. Um, and one of the other pieces of lore in that book, which is briefly mentioned in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, um, talks about a place called Raven Rock. Um, it was the, the screams from Raven Rock. And that legend actually talks about, um, it says here, a woman, so we have read, wandered out of the path in blinding snowstorm and sought shelter from the blast of the wind in the ravine behind Raven Rock. The snow drifted in upon her and she went to sleep never to awaken again. Ever since, that cleft has been a melancholy place of refuge, for it is said that the spirit of the poor wayfarer meets the belated wanderer with cries that sound like the screaming of the wind and gestures that remind one of the sweep of snowdrifts. 
warning others away from the spot that she found so fatal. There are, all in the land, many legends of many ghosts, but none I think of so kindly and Christian as a complexion as this poor specter of Raven Rock. So, oh, here it actually goes on that Raven Rock is not only inhabited by her, um, the Wraith of the White Woman is not the only one that the rock boasts. A native girl who perished of a jealous lover has an older, has an older claim and the ravens used to tell, and the ravens used to tell of still a third, a colonial dame who fled from the dreadful attentions of two amorous Tory, of, two, of a two amorous Tory raider in the dark days of the old war. Bless her so, heart, man. She jumped yeah. off. <laughs> but yeah, so. yeah. And that's a Terrytown, right? That's a. Yes. That yeah. Was, yeah. 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 So these are, yeah. Halda was also a Sleepy Hollow area, Terrytown area. And so is, yeah, Raven Rock. So yeah. yeah it, it was I'm, really... I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that Washington Irving did not mention Halda. I know. So it makes me wonder if it, maybe it was a maybe it was a later story that developed over time. Um, I'm wonder, I'm wondering and also as well. too, he was only in Sleepy Hollow area for what for a few years. Like he as a teenager, then he we know he traveled up the Hudson. He went up into New York a little bit more. Then he went to Europe. Mm -hmm. So you know, as far as what he's actually writing about, the time frame that he's writing about. Um, you know, he mentions how all these men get around the fire and they start talking about, um, you know, this, their, their exploits during the war and even the stories, even either war stories or ghost stories that tie together that perhaps he just missed this one. I mean, maybe this is one that was told a little bit later, you know, um, yeah, that he just he wasn't in the right circle to hear, hear this one. And that's possible, you know, or maybe it was a more modern construct. You know, maybe mm -hmm. we know that sometimes um, these stories will take on a life of their own. And sometimes, you know, maybe Hulda, Hulda was a real person and maybe she did fight. But the whole the whole thing about her being a witch and all of that, like maybe that developed a little bit later on and something that he just wouldn't have been necessarily aware of. So that's possible, I suppose. Yeah, that yeah. could be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, um, ask if anybody, I want to open up the floor, uh, before we move on to more stories, cause there are more and, uh, from different parts of the country. So has anybody heard of any revolutionary ghost stories, uh, either through your travels, your reading, um, maybe where you live, um, does anybody live in the areas that the revolution took place and can share any ghost stories with us? Anybody, anybody got any actual, any, anything they've heard? I will say personally, the only one myself that I, and I won't even call it a ghost story. It's not an actual ghost story. However, um, I did visit a long time ago when I was a teenager, our, our family visited the Battle of Cowpens down in South Carolina. And I do remember us, we went through the museum. Uh, apparently then you can, basically you go out into where the battlefield was. They've, they've put this paved little kind of loop park back there that you can walk through. And um, it was my mother, myself and my little brother. And I do remember it just felt very dark. And to the point where my mother looked at me and she said, I don't, I don't like it here. I don't, there's, there's something not right here. And, and you just felt this heavy, heavy dark sadness we that we couldn't explain it we didn't hear anybody else we didn't see anything um and so we just it was one of those kind of made you uncomfortable whatever it was and we left and it turns out that according to the story with the battle of cowpens it was very um it was a very very uh um harsh ending to a lot of the men that were there there was a lot of hessians there by the way i don't know these hessians they you know, isn't that funny, the tie back to the German stories, and yet some of these are actually coming out of German backgrounds, which is interesting to me. Um, but that there were several wounded Hessian soldiers that were left there that night after the battle. They couldn't get to them, um, and there were wolves that were coming and eating them while they were still alive. And it was a very, very horrific scene in that area. Since then, there's a lot of people that will say that they They've heard things, they've heard cries, they, they've heard things. So um, 
you know, there is a definitely a, a local tradition there that the Battle of Calpens is is a haunted place. But you know, again, that's that's my only personal experience. That's that's the only one that I had you know had any kind of encounter with. But again, it's like even just yeah, I've traveled up and down the East Coast a bit, and I mean, I've not I've not really looked for you know someone to tell me stories, but yet it's not something that is necessarily featured. And yet, with the Civil War, if we go, goodness, how many Civil War ghost stories are there out there? I mean, they're all over the place. Um, houses and battlefields and everything. Um, but again, Mr. Barefoot, he clearly found quite a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so, anybody else? Nobody wants to share any any ghost stories? I just want to say that it's it's truly sad that he did not cite the sources on that because for all of the research that I've been doing, you've been doing, you know, there's not it's really hard to find a collected a collected comprehensive, you know, collection of stories from the war. I mean, you can find them regarding the Civil War, but not like that. Um you have to go it's it's kind of like those times in genealogy where you can't where your wide net is not helpful and you have to go you have to really narrow down to like you know with with genealogy you have to go to the historic sites and and the local places it's almost like you have to reach down to that local level for this particular for these particular stories yes and that's a good point it's like you know as he was talking about like the little local communities and that was part of our suspicion with some of this as far as like you have to burrow so far down into the local level that you're you, they were stories that never they were never lifted into the national consciousness or the national storytelling as where i think the civil war really was um you've got i mean the civil war was only 40 years before the 20th century and so what happens in the 20th century we start getting different different abilities you know there's there's sound recordings there's video recordings we get you know people making movies about things like this and so it is kept into the 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 national conscious conscience that this actually was you know such an amazing conflict that it tore us apart and there are so many people that are that are lifting those stories out to try to to tell part of that national story and it's just with the revolution and i think part of it is too you know after the revolution, we're trying to build a country. We're busy, you know, we're really busy. Mm -hmm. And also then there's the war of 1812 that happens in the meantime, then you get in. I would have thought that maybe the year of the Jubilee in 26, 1826, we would have actually seen some more stories coming out about that. Um, but just not, not a lot now, but you do bring up a really good point about the local stories. Um, one of the things I had mentioned earlier was, you know, newspapers. We tried searching in newspapers um about anything spirit ghosts um i know we even tried witches right uh, to mm -hmm. try to get in that time period right after the revolution and they just weren't it wasn't coming up there there wasn't hardly anything coming no. out and i mean i found some gruesome things prior to that but um you mean more no, than like the witch you mean more in the the witch trials kind of thing or the yeah, some stuff, some stuff in the 17, uh, 1739, um, you know, just random accusations of witchcraft. Um, and, you know, I, I know you and I have talked about, I think post-Salem really, there was, you know, post-Salem and as I mentioned before, the, the kind of the need to break away from that European superstition mindset, there was a somewhat, I think, of an abandonment of pursuing the wonders or seeing them in everything and trying to focus on building a country. Um, you know, although because there was not that national mindset yet, you still had those outlying areas where superstition ran rampant. Um, but I think between that sort of societal transition and the, the aftermath of what Salem was, I mean, while it wasn't the only place that, you know, which persecution happened in the colonies, it was the biggest by far in terms of its notoriety mm -hmm. and the criticisms that came after that, I think really shook people. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yep. I mean, 
um, I was reading about how someone criticized not necessarily the accusations, but how they went about it, you know, the use of spectral evidence as a way to condemn it. Yeah. It, yeah. it just got so far out of control that I think a lot of mental, a lot of the mental mindset was to backpedal and be like, uh, we messed up. <laughs> yeah. Cause they didn't uh, do it again. I no. mean, unlike Europe where there would be outbreaks every once in a while, mm -hmm. um, where and, they in, in local communities based on what was happening. This yeah, was and fun, really, wasn't it? Or it was, it was the biggest one like that. I mean, um, there were some, there were some persecutions in Virginia, um, mm -hmm. Connecticut, even there were some witches there. Okay. Um, one of the more gruesome accounts that I read about um, in 1739, which I, I actually kind of want to talk about that because it's an interesting, you know, it's between Salem and the revolution. So it is, you know, um, it talks about how there was a, a farmer who would give out measures of grain or corn to elderly women when they asked for it. And one of the workers on the farm got it in his head that this elderly woman who was probably 60 or 70 years old was a witch. He just assumed she was. And he decided to test her on his own by some random, you know, witch test that he'd heard of that you can't, that no witch or devil can take more than they're offered or take more than their agreed upon share, their measure. So he tried to offer her more than what was previously agreed upon. And she denied it. She said, you know, I, your master wouldn't want that. I can't take more than that. And he determined that, oh, she can't take it. She must be a witch. And he stabbed her 40 times, at least. Yeah, yeah just random. So, you know, even, the, even though we were in that transition period in terms of the way we were thinking, there were, like I said, there were still those smaller little incidents that occurred. Right. unfortunately and you know again washington irving is painting ichabod crane as a character who he's holding tight to cotton mather's instructions on being able to identify mm -hmm. um anyone basically involved in witchcraft and and whatever and so that's 1790 1790 yeah. he's he's describing an educator as latching on to that kind of thing which had happened was that a hundred years prior? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, Cotton Mather, yeah, a hundred years before. So, I mean, long reaching in term in terms of that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even I didn't even think about the length of time. I know. And yeah, a hundred years later. And and it is isn't it in a way? I mean, the story itself, even though we have celebrated this this story as look how many, you know, how long this story has been part of our, our, our national, I should say fun identity, right? Like we, we love the story. Everybody loves the story around Halloween. And um, even though that's, that's part of what, or the purpose of this, you know, this literature is to entertain and everything because we know that it was written in 1820, it gives us that window in, into what, what they're talking about. The thing is, is that Washington Irving, I can't help but think he is, this is a tongue in cheek attack on someone like Ichabod Crane, who is supposedly educated, and yet he is latching on to these older mindsets about spirituality, about, um, you know, dark forces and stories of witchcraft and things like that. Because at the end of the story, the headless horseman chases him um, to a, you know, to the bridge. He can't cross the bridge which I'll let you explain why that it doesn't actually mention <laughs> that, but I'll explain. I'll let you explain that in a, in a second. But, you know, the story is one thing that surprised me, but a detail is it said that when he saw the headless horseman, that the head was resting on the pummel of the saddle. Mm -hmm. so he saw the head. Now it didn't say pumpkin. It said the head. <laughs> so, I noticed that. Uh, right. Which, which kind of goes back more to the Tim Burton version of, because I'm pretty sure, like the head, like you see that head more often in that movie than, yeah. than it's comfortable. <laughs> because that is not a good head. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. <laughs> um, but with that, we know that when he crosses that bridge, that the headless horseman takes that pumpkin or head and basically toss, you know, it hits him. And yet the next morning, all they find is his 
hat, I think, floating in the stream, from what mm -hmm. I remember that it said, <laughs> and yet, and remnants of a pumpkin that had been there. And um, so therefore, and then later on, they try to temper the story by, instead of saying that, I mean, because, hey, genealogically speaking, the story then talks about how um, the guy he'd been staying with decides to go through all of his effects and disperse them because, they they assume he's dead so they're mm -hmm. going through like the probate process of all of his his things and and dispersing of them and then later so everybody's assuming he's dead well that's a pretty yeah. violent end for this this schoolmaster and yet then they temper this he tempers the story at the end by saying oh well there were reports that you know he actually just got scared off he was a pumpkin and you know there was reports that he actually made it to New York and somebody saw him there. He became, was it a banker or something or a politician? Mm -hmm. a yeah. A politician. I think he went to law school, I think. Yes. So yeah. but that was a, that's know. a pivot, <laughs> you know, right. But I think that's yeah. part of the, well, let's not make it a complete that the ghost actually murdered him at the end of the thing. Um, yeah. what, you, what was it you said about um, water and that water? So water in folklore has it it has a lot of well like rivers it has a lot of channels and avenues um so in in relation to this story and saying that the horseman cannot cross the bridge likely stems from the um belief that running water is either a doorway to the other world or um washes away spirits it cleanses them it has cleansing and purifying properties. Now, um, in terms of witch lore, I believe it was King James who had stated that um, one of the, the, if anyone's familiar with the trials, there was the whole swimming a witch. If they floated, they were guilty. If they sunk, they were innocent, very logical. Um, throw me in water and I'll probably sink. Um, but the belief behind that was that if someone were outside the faith of being Christian, that they had either renounced their baptism or were never baptized, therefore the waters would not receive them. So, um, in a way that's, that's how water kind of, it would, he couldn't cross because it rejected him in a way. Right. Um, right. so yeah. And, and one of the descriptions too, one of the guys that was talking about how their encounter with um the with the headless horseman, not Brom Bones, his encounter was one way, but the, the other guy had talked about how the headless horseman, once he got to that area, he like what was it? He flew up into the air. He turned into a skeleton and like yeah. flew up into the air, which is again connecting back to that spiritual nature and then the biblical verse about you know the prince the prince and uh prince of the air. Uh, Prince of the Power of the Air. So that I thought was an interesting, uh, an interesting description of his encounter with him as well. One thing that I noticed at the end, and I had to go back and reread and reread, because you know how sometimes in these stories, it gets very verbose and you have to slow yourself down. Um, there... I'm wondering, because you know, you know there's the speculation on whether Brahm was the... Um, Brom was the one that chased Ichabod. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if it if Irving may have given that away, or if this is just one of those I'm misreading. Um, where is it? So this is where Ichabod has just seen the bridge, and he's saying, "If I can just get there." Um. Another convulsive kick in the ribs and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side. And now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer would vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then he saw the goblin, which I love how he's constantly using goblin to describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, very interchangeable in a way at the time. Um, just then he saw the goblin rising on his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him, Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust and gunpowder 
the black steed and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind. Does that not sound like the horseman continued direction across the bridge after hitting Ichabod? Yes. Or yes. is that just one of those, you know how you see it in movies sometimes from the perspective of someone who's falling and spinning every, you know, passed by as he's spiraling into the brook or into the river. Or if like, if the, if the horseman had tried to, had attempted to cross the bridge, kind of like almost he was taken up in a whirlwind, which is, yeah. which is that spiritual nature of what he was. Now, granted, I think it could have just been that Brahms was, the one that yeah. was you know, chasing I wonder- him and the trajectory of both horses basically went off and that's you know that that was his experience so yeah you're right yeah. i think it could have been that as well i had to keep reading that going okay it sounds like he crossed the bridge <laughs> right? i know well yeah. and not to i don't know maybe i'm wrong you can you've read it too wasn't the church on the other side of the bridge i think i think it was like if you're oh, going at it Say the church would be on your right, the bridge is on the left. He took the left and went across the bridge. Okay. So, so the okay. horseman would have been on the side with the church, in my right. understanding. Because okay. I was going to say his detail was that that horse, the that the horseman's headless horseman's horse was in the <laughs> graveyard, uh, the churchyard, uh, that they would see him there many times. So yes. I'm just like, that can't be if he's on the other side of the bridge. So it, yeah. Depending on how the reader wants the story to end, you, I think it could go either way. If you want it to be Brom, then yeah, he ran across the bridge. If you want it to be the mysterious horseman, the spirit of the air, then you could say he passed by kind of in like Ichabod's vision as he's spinning off the off of gunpowder. Right. Yes. So oh my gosh. A little side note that I thought again, again, reading this fiction in your genealogy studies um this one here in the history of terry towns when they described or talked about uh or i should say address they have a whole history on washington irving and his um his influence and his living there you know he's buried there in that churchyard and um well no not that churchyard i don't think i don't remember i don't remember i don't know if you remember he's in the in the main one where the van tassels are or if he's another one there but he's in he's buried in sleepy hollow that's what i know um but anyway one of the details that they gave in here was that after this story that there was a surge or in the popularity of pumpkins. And so the farmers started growing more pumpkins after this story because people were actually buying them and they, they, they wanted, they wanted those pumpkins more than they had wanted them before the story came out. So I'm like, well, that's an interesting economic development based on just a short story and the popularity that it had. Well, it's even more funny because if you look at the history of the jack-o'-lantern, they were usually carved to ward off evil spirits. Yes. Yes. That's true. So it's funny that an evil spirit would take that up as a replacement head. That's true. That's um, true. We did have a comment from uh, from Fred. Tam O'Shanter escapes the witch Cuddy Sark on horseback when he crosses the Brigadoon Bridge. So there's another... With the Brigadoon story, there's another relation, um, another um, reference to a bridge or that body of water being the stopping point that a spirit can't go across that, which is interesting. And bridges, in addition to crossing water, bridges themselves actually are known for their, you know, being a transitional point, you know. Right. From Indiana to Kentucky, you have to, you know, cross the river. So right. it, it's it's like... If you want to look at it in, a, in the more spiritual context of the time, it's like going between worlds. Yeah. So, oh, and I is. wonder. Oh, it totally is. You're crossing. Yeah, well, yeah. You go into different worlds when you cross the Ohio River. <laughs> well, and if you think about it, the horseman was buried in the church, churchyard, yes. by the churchyard, which was by the bridge. Yes. Maybe he was tethered to his body still, and he couldn't. Crossing the, you know, crossing. I'm really reaching there. I'm going no, down. But the- <laughs> according to the map, remember the map we saw? There was yeah. a swamp and then where the bridge was. So it was kind of in a little little pocket of area there. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe he was just, you know. Yeah. Supernatural house arrest. I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, and so actually, here's another. Again, we were talking about the little local histories, how the little local histories are that's probably been the biggest place for us to have found a lot of these stories. Um, again, not, not ghost story collections like the spirits of 76 book, but these little tiny little places. And I, you know, 
I, I never did do any correlation to read to see whether what was in these ended up in the Spirits of 76 book, because I actually just got that a couple of days ago. It just arrived. Um, so, but here's a little one that I thought is an interesting, an interesting little anecdote. Um, this is literally, this one's out of, it's called Woodside. Um, and it is from a little community. It says Woodside's the north end of Newark, New Jersey. Sorry, Siri's trying to talk to me. Um, so the north the north end of Newark, New Jersey is where Woodside is located. This book is about it. It's it's history, legends, and ghost stories. So um, it says gathered from the records and the older inhabitants now living. And this was done in 1909. Um, here's an interesting little anecdote because it doesn't give us much, but it's called Ghost of a British Spy. Then there was the English spy who legend says was captured by a party of Americans and promptly hanged on the limb of a large tree that stood at the bend of the road. His ghost was for long a sad handicap to the neighborhood and singular as it may seem, he is said to have played his wildest pranks with those who placed the greatest faith in him. But since the spread of the Mount Pleasant Cemetery down toward his abode, little or nothing has been heard of his doings. One theory is that of late he has come within the orbits of so many other ghosts, but of a more respectable and orderly character, that he has become in inextricably tangled, much as is reported of wireless messages when many amateurs assault the air. So <laughs> what's interesting, this reminded me very much of the capture of John Andre story until you get to the part where it says that the British spy was hanged because now, John Andre was hung, but he was not at not at the tree where they captured him. So is this is this like a perversion of that story that made it into New Jersey? Because, you know, you're in an area, you're in the same kind of valley, you know, New Jersey and New York and, and, and all of this. Is that part of that? Because it was a British spy or is it one one that happened right here? It's a totally different thing. It's just that there's no details as far as who this guy was. What was he captured for? Um, the idea that they captured him and immediately hung him instead of, you know, John Andre was given a trial before they uh, executed him officially. So, but he was higher ranking. He was also a major. Um, but anyway, again, it was a little tied to the revolution, but yet not a whole lot that was given in some of these. Um, there was another one I thought, um, let's see. This was one, this is called Virginia Ghosts. And this one was done in... 1966 <clears throat> and these are tied very much to a lot of houses so this one uh the one example i had more was called penmore Woo! Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna show you um and so there was a house that was built in 1727 and then it talks about um fielding lewis who died colonel lewis who died in 1781 and let's see, uh, basically, he was a revolutionary soldier. And in that house, because it still stood, that you could hear in the halls and on the stairs, the heavy tread of a man's foot, the crunching of gravel, the scraping of the foot on stone step can be heard. Bedroom, nor bedroom doorknobs turn and footsteps are heard in. Let's see, one of the let's see, bedroom doorknobs turn and footsteps are heard in the rooms of those as those of a mortal. One of the bedroom doors could not be opened for several days. It seemed to stick tightly. And at closing at closing one time, one evening, the caretaker say, said, I must get a carpenter in the morning and get that door open. Next morning, the door was found standing wide open. So they don't have a reason. It says no one knew what, rest, what restless spirit revisited until one day in broad daylight, the lady in charge saw Colonel Fielding Lewis standing in an upper room where once he attended to business affairs. He held in, hand, in his hand a paper and seemed to be reading it. He was wearing the costume of revolutionary times. So again, it's very, very tied to a building, uh, a place. And um, speaking of, I am gonna go ahead and share screen real quick. We can keep talking, but I'm going to share. Here's one, let's go to George. We're gonna go to the Mount Vernon website. And um, Mount Vernon has, if you look up ghost stories on their website, it says there's been, Reports by visitors and staff at George Washington's home of super, supernatural activity 
and below our number of Mount Vernon ghost stories they've reported over the years. So this is a really fun read. I would I would encourage people to go do that. It's at mountvernon.org. And yes, they do say that George Washington himself is one of the ghosts that they that people have encountered. And in fact, as early as in fact, this this very first account they talk about is from a newspaper account, New York World newspaper. They've 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 pulled out this little image that they've clipped from it from 1890, New York World newspaper, and it talks about these women. That was um, if. For those of you who know, I'm sure a lot of you know that Mount Vernon was um, saved by a ladies, ladies association. And so these years of where the ladies are actually going there, trying to care for the things, trying to be, bring back some of the furniture that was that was um, parceled out and trying to work on and plan on restoring the house. Some of the women actually chose to sleep in the room where Washington died. I just Personally, I'm going, I don't know that I would have done that. Um, but anyway, and they were awake, awakened by the ghost of George Washington. So that is a, a story that apparently that happened to more than one of them. But this one account is in 1890, where he's scaring, scaring them in the middle of the uh, uh, the middle of the night. And then, of course, there's the woman on the stairs. Apparently, that is another uh, apparition that they see a lot. I don't know that they know who it is, but all through i don't know how often the george washington ghost actually appears to people um or whether that's a current thing or if that was more earlier uh because of the accounts but apparently the woman on the stairs that's one that um, happens quite a lot apparently and then here's another angry gentleman and whatnot but so those are really fun reads and then um i don't have this one pulled up but there's another one about um there's another one about ben ben franklin's ghost um, or should I say statue? It's, um, oh gosh, help me out. Is this Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia, the American, was it the Philosophical Society? I believe in, down, in downtown Philadelphia. And there is a, at the top of the library, on the outside, there's there's this little concave section that's got this marble statue of Ben Franklin wearing a toga. And there's been several stories about people who are visiting that area and they are outside of that place and they encounter someone who is basically Ben Franklin in a toga and he's dancing with people and then he dances over to a tavern and they claim that the statue is gone whenever they see Ben dancing down the streets and then he'll eventually disappear and his, his statue will be back there. And then there's been people that have said he was in the library. He is, he has definitely haunted people in the library. He's knocked over some books all kinds of things. And so Ben apparently is quite a naughty statue slash <clears throat> ghost, I guess. <laughs> so there's a couple that we know. Um, here's another comment um, if from Griffith, uh, M. Griffith. If memory serves, many elder beliefs held that evil spirits could not cross running water, it being pure and cleansing. This belief often appears in later tales, through the, though the writer may not know or cite the origin. So, yes, yeah, so you were talking about um, some of that earlier with, um, yes, as we were talking about the, the purity of the water. And um, yes, and then he's also continues his belief in witches and other supernatural entities remain alive in pockets of Appalachia. And that's very true. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very true. I'm just out of Kentucky. Bell Witch, that was one that comes to, comes to mind. Um, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. That does continue. Speaking of the Bell Witch, um, oh God, was, it, was it Jefferson or was it Andrew Jackson? I think it was Andrew Jackson. Somehow was involved with the Bell Witch. Really? Yeah, I was... Um, that was one of the stories that I was finding, you know, the, the tale of the Bell Witch and that Andrew Jackson kind of went to investigate it. Um, I did not pursue that because, you know, like I said, I was trying, I was really trying to right. keep focus here. <laughs> and like with uh, what with M. Griffith said, you know, about witches in Appalachia. Oh, I know. Oh, I was so, trying so hard to not just get <laughs> off topic. Well, because for a while there, we were talking about possibly having to pursue a, a little more focus on the witch aspect because we weren't finding a lot yes uh, but then somehow we yes it just started popping up well let's let's then pivot just a little bit into who settled appalachia 
Um, these were, there's a lot of Scotch Irish. So you've got a lot of people that were coming over and settling into the mountain areas. And then, and they did a lot of them fought for the revolution. And then they came in into the mountains even more farther in. And those that stayed in that region and didn't go any further west, um, that's one of the reasons like they talk about it, and they've done studies about, you know, the, the Appalachian accent and how it is very tied to um, to your older forms of English um, from the British Isles. And so naturally, it's like that older connection to not only their accents, but I think also their stories are also in there and have just been adapted into that, into that region as well. Um, oh, good. Yeah. He's got a, a, um, a suggestion. Booker's witches and haints, Appalachian ghost stories and the Fox fire. Yeah. The Fox fire traditions. Have you heard of that one Walker? The, the Fox fire. In passing, in passing. Yeah. I think either I've got that title in my digital collection or um, I came across that title in the last couple of weeks when I was gearing up for this mm -hmm. discussion. Um, right. There is, since we're actually sort of now getting into, we're coming West, we're, we're having our own little Westward expansion at the moment mm -hmm. in this conversation. I do actually want to talk about a story that I did find here in local. Yes. Louisville. yes. Um, this is one from my own personal collection. Let's see if I can do the, there we go. Ghosts of old no. Louisville. Yep, um, it's by local author, David Domine. I don't know if I got that accent right on the end, um, but this is a story about a local site called Fort George. Uh, so, despite its grand Victorian traditions, the old Louisville neighborhood does have a small bit of colonial history to add to the mix. On a spacious plot of land on the 1200 block of Floyd Street, Almost hidden behind a low wrought iron fence, a small granite monument placed there in 1947 by the Daughters of the American Revolution. I need to pause because I was getting my dates confused with Hulda's gravestone. Because um, oh. <laughs> I said 1947 for that. So oh, I need to gotcha. correct myself there. Gotcha. Um, but Hulda does have a gravestone put, mm -hmm. put out. Um, back to this. A small granite monument placed there by in 1947 by the daughters of the american revolution marks the spot where fort george once stood named for george gray friend of george washington and revolutionary war hero the estate and grounds were home to gray and his wife mildred when they returned to kentucky in the early 1800s now bounded by smaller shotgun structures the tiny park has a narrow path leading visitors to two unassuming headstones that mark the final resting spot of the grays and now here's where the Lord gets spooky. On foggy mornings, neighbors and passerby have reported a colonial gentleman with powdered wig and waistcoat emerging from the mist and then vanishing. When winter has robbed the elms and chestnut trees of their leaves and only bare branches block out a gray, dreary sky, locals claim they have heard the gallop of horses' hooves across the frozen ground near their houses. On other occasions, neighbors have heard a lovely lady's voice with an English accent singing old American folk songs. Have colonial specters from the past returned to explore the present and America's largest Victorian neighborhood? <laughs> we mapped that one out too. It's, um, yeah. I'm going to say, what was it? Maybe six blocks from the river if you kind of yeah, it's, it's Yeah, it's not that far. It's not that far. I might actually drive by there. <laughs> I know, right? We'd like to go find it. Um, because at first, when he found this story, I thought maybe it was connected with George Rogers Clark because, I mean, Kentucky was technically like the Western frontier. Even the Mississippi was part of the Western frontier of the Revolutionary War. So we can't necessarily say that the revolutionary activity was totally relegated to the Eastern coast. It wasn't. Um, but that's one thing I was... I thought, well, maybe that was part of the ghost story, but no, it was just a revolutionary soldier that had settled in the area and he continues to haunt um, his place. However, I don't know, you know, a horse's hooves, that's kind of, uh, that could be a little generic there as far as, um, could be some other activity that we're not quite aware of. Truly. And I, I mean, it's almost cliche at that point to say, oh, there's horse's hooves from a colonial time point, but <laughs> But then on the other hand, if you want to go back to the horsemen, you know, mm -hmm. what is the, what are the significance of horses in terms of spectral activity? Right. Because 
if you if we want to jump back to the inspiration, which was Sir Walter Scott, mm -hmm. whose interest was in Germanic folklore, which is one of the more prominent areas where they talk about something called the Wild Hunt, which was a procession of the undead through the skies, through the air, um, you know, to collect the stray spirits. Um, I mean, it's lore that, you know, you don't go out when the hunt is about kind of thing. Um, it would, you know, you could be picked up and carried away with them. Yeah. Um, if anyone's more, in, if anyone's interested in those more folkloric aspects and possible source material for the horsemen, I have another book from my collection that I just want to recommend. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's yeah. just It's ah. too spooky. <laughs> It is too spooky. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. Phantom <laughs> Armies of the Night. Ooh. Wow. The Wild Hunt and Ghostly Processions of the Undead. This one is by Cloud Le Coteau. And he's he's a big author in terms of folklore and myth. Um, I have quite a few of his texts and they are very good and authoritative. Um, but I was just I was seeing a lot of you know, in addition to our Headless Horseman that we're talking about, I was looking at the inspiration for it, which, you know, if you go back to Irish lore, there's the Dullahan, which is a being that um, is headless, rides a horse, and, you know, there was some mention of blood sacrificing, which I don't want to get that gory. Um, that, actually, <laughs> though, that ties back to the Tim Burton version, doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. So bloody. <laughs> For me, it was so bloody that I was like, Ooh. I, however, there's a nasty tree in it. So I don't know if it's combining the whole John Andre tree with uh, some of I that. I think it, he may have taken, I mean, creative liberties. Um, Absolutely. Speaking of horsemen, though, and you had mentioned um, another story. There is a, uh, I did find that there are a couple other headless horsemen throughout the States. Um, I found a story regarding, this one actually was in Texas, um, that in Southern Texas, there was a writer who was executed for hustling in the 19th century. After his execution, his head was tied to his horse, which was then set loose to serve as a warning to others. It said that he haunts the route the horse took after being turned loose. Um, it's even been a topic of academic research since the mid 19th century. Really? Yes. What are we researching? Just. I guess the the lore aspect of it and whether or not it's real. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. and that was one that I I kind of want to go a little deeper into it at some point. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, oh, go ahead. I would say coming back to the revolution, um, there's Swamp Fox, uh, Francis oh, Marion. Yeah. Francis Marion. Um, there's a story about a kind of secret mission that he did. Where was it? It was in Georgetown, South Carolina, the Mansfield pl Plantation. Apparently during that, he or one of his um, troop had decapitated a, the only guard on duty and after that that decapitated guard's head or that decapitated guard was seen around the grounds um yeah uh just a few nights later a servant at wedgefield plantation saw a headless man staggering up the drive dressed in his uniform blood dripping from his neck the servant fled at first no one believed what she had seen but a few nights later the plantation owner's daughter heard hoof beats in the drive again we kept, we have a horse um, <laughs> she looked out her window to see the headless sentry climbing off his horse. He stumbled toward the veranda and disappeared. Over the years, many other sightings of ghosts were reported. Wedgefield Plantation burned to the ground in the 1930s, later rebuilt, serves as a country club today. Wow. And that is from the book Only in Your State, which I had seen those books, you know, yeah. I see them at Barnes and Noble and everything, or, or the yeah. spooky Indiana or spooky Kentucky books, and I just kind of, right. I bat a, a snobbish eye at them and now i'm going hmm. <laughs> mm. which is interesting too you mentioned um sometimes too i've noticed that when sometimes when an older property burns down the ghost doesn't always go away that if they rebuild 
uh, sometimes it's tied yeah. to land, I guess, or that that place, and not necessarily the structure. Um, by the way, there was a, a news story, and I won't tell you what what rag of news story I was listen- I was actually reading to find it, but it was a story apparently that just came out. Oh goodness, it was either Philadelphia or New York. I can't remember. It was a t- it's a it's called the Library, which is a like an inn or a tavern. And it was built. It was originally built in like 1781, but it, or maybe earlier, but it was burnt. It burnt in 1781. They rebuilt it in 1783, and it's haunted. And apparently today, there was a story about um, that their video camera caught uh, an image of a ghost going across, and it actually saw, set off their alarms right outside. So I was just like, mm, "That's revolutionary period right there." So uh, <laughs> you know, I always say they're going to be they're going to be more active this time of the year because Halloween is so close. Uh, Absolutely. Yes, which which we love, and again. You know, like I said, this kind of a book, The Spirits of 76, I mean, as thick as that is, every state, he's got multiple stories um, for those up and down that East Coast. And um, it's a fun read. And and again, it, it there's a lot of landmarks that you can learn about anyway. So even if you're not even necessarily interested in the ghost stories themselves, there's a lot of different battle um, details in here and about different taverns and inns and restaurants. It's just all throughout these. And frankly, I mean, this is the kind of book where next time I, you know, travel back East, I'm going to be looking at some of these. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of known ones. I mean, like once you get to Massachusetts, of course, you know, there's one, there's one associated with the battle of Lexington Concord. There's, um, Oh gosh, there's another one that with the Boston massacre, even they've even one one of the stories, uh, the anecdotes in here was that, um, that Christmas Addicts comes out. <clears throat> they see him in that that space um, on State Street where the where the the circle is to commemorate the Boston Massacre. That they said that people have seen Christmas Addicts walking along in that area on March fifth anniversary, and they said that then. It, but if they get closer, he will like act like he's been shot and like fall down and then disappear. So um, I know that you know that's. I mean, look, look at Salem, look how much they celebrate the witch, the witch trials and such. I think just, you know, up those areas are just permeated with a lot of these stories that we just don't necessarily hear over here. And so, you know, I'm not going to say that they're not out there. We know the stories are out there. It's just who's collected them. Not, not just seriously, this guy's been (laughs) the only ones I've seen who's actually collected a lot of them. And again, I just wish he put his sources in there so we could kind of get a, um, a sense of where they're being shared um, in order to collect them. I mean, are they, are they, is this a lot of them still being verbally shared and not necessarily written down, which is kind of alarming. Um, didn't you say, and I won't, I won't, I won't put you on the spot to pressure you because I don't remember if you actually got to, to see that, but you said there was somebody that had mentioned that there was like a ghost story in Draper, even the Draper collection or something. Somebody had mentioned that. Uh, um, yes. Uh what was I reading? I mean, it's one of the books on my desk right now, I'm sure. <laughs> and, I, and, I did, and I did try to find, I looked up ghosts or spirits in the Draper collection. So those of you who are familiar with the Draper collection, that is a, uh, it's a series of interviews and tidbits collected by Lyman Copeland Draper um, in the mid 19th century. And he understood that the history was fading away from those who'd fought in the revolution, War of 1812. He was interviewing family members of he was either interviewing the people who had fought or involved in the revolution in war of 1812 or their children and grandchildren if they didn't serve, weren't still around and so it's 133 reels of microphone we have the collection here at the um at the sar library but i looked for it in indexes because it's not been fully comp- it's not been comprehensively indexed there's a series of indexes doesn't cover everything but you said that there was some sort of note that you had seen someone there's no, a ghost story in there so it, what it was, was um, it was a presentation. There was a speaker that had given a presentation on witches in the revolutionary era. And Draper was one of his sources. Wow. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't find a recording or anything of it. Yeah, yeah. So, so and it, it, we're on the lookout for that, because that would be really yes. interesting. And it could be uh, part of what Draper does. Um, maybe Draper wasn't necessarily recording something about 
the ghost or that mm-hmm. part. It could have been just the details behind the story, i.e., who was the original person that maybe the story came out about, right? So yes, we don't know. I'd love yeah. to find it sometime, but yeah, no, that's another. Again, even he, like I said, I tried. I even tried that source to see if he had done anything in there as well. But again, not fully, not comprehensively indexed. Um, that's a challenge, and it's never been digitized, so it's on microfilm. So good luck there. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, we are at about five minutes. Any any final? Anybody want to comment on anything? Um, if if nobody jumps in. Then I think that do you have Walker? Do you have that the quote that you were reading from that article earlier today about the sense of place and where? The, yes, um, I've got a lot these, of quotes. <laughs> why these, yeah, why these stories are so important when we are researching our family history? Yes, so um, I've got a couple here, and let me see which one. So here's one to start. Folk legends are not just about the self, but about the particular concerns of people who tell the legend. Um, Many local narratives work to define a place as a particular kind of community with a distinct history and value system. So, you know, that kind of that, I mean, what is doing genealogy if not about reaffirming or solidifying or finding your identity? I mean, that is what folk tales do in a way, especially in a communal setting. Um, here's another one. Locating ourselves in narratives endows us with identities, however multiple, ambiguous, or conflicting they may be. And we all know that in genealogical research, you find a lot of conflicting things at times. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And just think about the layers that we've already picked out just from reading The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And as, mm-hmm. as Halloween approaches, I would encourage you all to do that. Um, it is a really good read. Uh, by the way, quick, do you, can you tell us who it was you were quoting? Well, that was an article, wasn't it? Um, so one of the articles I was reading, so this is a quote from a person called M.R. Somers, S-O-M-E-R-S, but it is from an article. Um, it's an article called It Makes Sense to Us. Um, and the author is... S. Elizabeth Bird. Great. Um, the yeah. is where we're, where we're getting the information. Uh, yes. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, this is great. And I, I, yeah, I think you learned so much. Um, gosh. And, and as we were looking through newspaper accounts, trying to research some of this, some of the little stories we were coming across that were not really related to ghost stories, but just, I'm amazed. I mean, I could just, Oh gosh, what was the story in France about the 40 monks that were poisoned by a keg of wine in Bordeaux? Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> that one. <laughs> Just so many stories that come out of newspapers and because well, that was a major way that they told the that they told these stories, really. Yeah. Like word of mouth and then newspapers. Yes, you had books, but newspapers were in more people's hands. Yeah. I was thinking about that too. Yeah. about the accessibility. Yeah. Um, one last share my screen. I'm going to say thank you all for coming. If anybody has any last minute questions, um, let's see. And I'm going to try to share something real quick because I just want to let you know what coming, what is coming up in December. I don't think we have one scheduled for November, but we do have coming up in December, the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party is coming up this December 16th. And if you go to the main sar.org website, look for library. And once you get there, go to the events page and we are having Boston Tea Party celebrations. We're having locally, we're having a real tea. We're gonna serve all five, um, all five types of tea that they toss into the harbor. Some people will be, even be able to drink their tea from an 18th century teacup from my collection. And um, and then in the afternoon, we're having another virtual, free virtual event here. So if you want to register for either of those, you just have to go to that events page, click on the register for event, whichever one. If you're doing both, you'd have to register for both individually. 
But again, that is one of the things we were really excited about because, hey, we're getting into the season. You know, the actual 250th event or 250th celebration usually is going to be kicking off in um, 2026, but this is an early event. So 250th of the Boston Tea Party is actually very important. So please consider joining us for that. And um, thank you all. We're at four o'clock and this has been really great. <laughs> it's still raining here. Is it still raining? Yeah, it's still raining. <laughs> You've got that spooky atmosphere going on. Yes. <laughs> and it gets darker there sooner. It, 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 it's getting... It's not dark yet, but it's getting dark. It's getting there. <laughs> yes. so, would you say it's prime weather for reading The Legend of Sleepy Hollow? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. What you're going to be doing tonight? Yes, I'm going to be doing that tonight. <laughs> oh, well, thank you all for coming, and um, we hope to see you guys next time at a future one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.